Grateful to you who are with us even now and in the days ahead. Grateful to be with you even this way. And we're uh, doing what we always do about this time every Sunday, jumping into what some people would call a message, some people would call a sermon, some people would say, you better preach it. However uh, however that goes, uh, trust that this will mean what God means to you and then, of course, uh, through you as he has his way. Uh, the title of this message is Obedience to God Brings Blessings to and Through You. Uh, it's as though, maybe one way to look at that this is that from God's point of view, your obedience is, is magnetic to him, that it, it really does... Um, uh, bring a a sense of uh, connection for sure that he desires he has promised to bless obedience and we'll see in just a moment he also promises to curse disobedience and you can't have one without the other uh, that's a, a big a big part of of the reality of who God is we need to come to God for who he is on his terms not who we may think he is or want him to be uh, on our terms uh, think about the people you know, and we're going to do this, and we're going to take 30 seconds. I'm just giving you a heads up, 30 seconds of silence. It may feel longer than 30 seconds, but it won't be. And uh, do this with me if you would. Think about the people you know who have been dispensers of God's blessings to you. People you know that have been God's person bringing Something from God to you through them. As they come to mind, thank God for them. And then sometime later today, after this message and this gathering has ended, reach out to them and thank them personally if they're still alive. The people, the people in your life who have been gifts from God and you know it, and that through their lives came a blessing you never would have had. So, so let's, so let's start this message actually doing that. For the next 30 seconds, think about the people you know who have been dispensers of God's blessings to you. Maybe just one person you'll be thinking about for the full 30 seconds. But you think about somebody who you know God brought into your life to bless you on His behalf. Close your eyes. Think about who that person is. Thank God for them. And if they've gone on ahead, thank them in your heart. And, after we're through gathering here this morning, call them or email them or text them or something and let them know that you're grateful for how God blessed you through them. Let's do that for 30 seconds. Isn't it just beautiful to use your brain and your heart that way for just a little bit? And to really be grateful. For me, of course, I prepared for this before doing that. For me, the person that first came to mind is Dorothea Black. And she is still alive. And I am going to call her or text her or email after the service is over. Um, she and uh, her husband, Don, Live this. They were blessings to me long before I knew the Lord. Some of you know I started drinking and smoking dope when I was 12. And, and, and through those years in my life, uh, as I was unraveling, as our family had been torn apart by our dad's departure, um, uh, some of you have heard that story, very, very painful. That's not an excuse for what I did, but it helps explain it, that's for sure. Uh, and, and during that messed up, you know, entering my teen years, uh, family torn to pieces, Don and Dorothea Black, it wasn't like I was their new project, but I knew that I was loved by them and that they cared for me. And I have a vivid memory one night being at a party, and uh, I hadn't been misbehaving with drugs or alcohol at that party, but I didn't have a ride home. And somehow or another, somebody said, well, they knew the Blacks. It was midnight. It was after midnight. He came and got me and drove me home. Isn't that just, I mean, not about even his son. He was just loving me, caring for me. At his funeral, I played the trumpet at his funeral. At his funeral, uh, the verse that he chose 
to be elevated in celebration of God's gift to him was Micah 6, 8. And some of you know that verse. It says, do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. And he and she, she still is, and he was an embodiment of that. Do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. That's what they did. And so, so I, I, I mentioned, you know, you think about who those people are in your life. Um, you could probably spend the rest of the morning telling me about who you were thinking about. I could tell you the rest. I could take the rest of the morning talking more about the Don and, and Dorothea Black. But here's the thing. Whenever someone discovers the why behind the what concerning something that's good and beautiful and important and right, I wish I would have known while they were showing me God's love that they knew God's love. I was so oblivious and so hard-hearted and so blinded by by the enemy, certainly. And uh, I just didn't have a clue back then. I wish I could go back and from the get-go say, thank you. I know, I see what you're doing now. <laughs> but uh, but that's that, that, that wasn't happening then. But when you discover, someone discovers the why behind the what concerning something that's good, beautiful, important, and right, that information should be shared with others. No ifs, ands, or buts. No questions. If you know the why behind the what of something that's good and beautiful and right and kind, then you need to share that with others. That's what today's message is all about. All about. And here, this is it in a nutshell. That obedience to God brings blessings from God, and blessings from God are meant to be constantly shared and not selfishly kept. When God blesses us, he doesn't bless us just so we can say, wow, we're blessed. No, he blesses us so that we in turn can be conduits of those blessings, that we can we can be dispensers and givers of, of those blessings to those around us. And and this often involves money, but it goes far beyond money or, or, or stuff. It's it's an attitude of heart that, that whatever blessing God gives us. That, that that blessing is not meant for us to keep and hoard and and selfishly you know you know just refuse to share but it, it's meant to it's meant to it's meant to go much further than just to us and all the way through us so the obe- the title again is obedience to god brings blessings to and through you it's uh, the life principles that orchestrate orchestrate and perpetuate life god's way it's part 7 we'll see how many parts we have before this uh, is over here's the theme when we obey God, he blesses us, and that blesses others. If we're truly blessed by God and our relationship with God is where it's supposed to be, our blessing becomes their blessing. It's just a matter of time. And the application is this. Embrace obedience to God and let his blessings flow through you to others. And his blessings can never flow through you until they've come to you. That's the heart of this and why it's so important that you and I obey God. Whatever he says, there's a a verse that we're not referencing, but it comes to mind even now that says, to obey is better than sacrifice. Whatever offering we bring, if our heart is a disobedient heart, but we're trying to impress God or look good in front of other people and we bring an offering, that it, it ultimately does not mean Hardly. In fact, nothing. In fact, maybe worse than nothing. If all the offering is is for show, but if we if we obey God, that means more to Him than any than any sacrifice we can make. And at, there are times when obedience is its own sacrifice, but obedience is always its own blessing. Earlier in this sermon series, we saw that God will take full responsibility for the consequences of our obedience to Him. That was, I think, either the first or second sermon in this series. This message is obedience 2.0 in that it's another aspect of what our obedience to God does in and through our lives. That he calls us to obey him. He doesn't, it, we, yesterday when we were gathering, looking at the great commandment and the great commandments and the great commission, the, the great commandments and the great commission aren't suggestions. They're directives to which we say yes or no. And we can say yes with our lips and never with our lives. So, they're, they're not suggestions. These are commandments. And, uh, and, we're, and, and obedience uh, obedience is, is, is either happening or it's not. Uh, obedience is its own reward, but the results aren't only for us. Today's message addresses and elevates our need to understand the reason for and the resulting expression of God's blessings in our lives. <clears throat> that if, if, you're a, if you're a blessed man or woman, 
then the people around you, without you having to say anything, should know that. Again, not just because you might have a really nice house or a big fancy car or something like that that people would call blessings. All those things are temporary. But, but your life is a life that's oriented toward others. That's a, re, that's a reflection of, of God. And, th- and those blessings are meant to flow far and wide. It's similar. Uh, uh, oh, here's where I stopped. I stopped there. Yeah, it's expression of God's blessings in our life. Listen to this. Refusing to obey God limits his lavish blessings in our lives. Can he still bless you if you don't obey him? He can. But he's promised to bless you when you do obey him. Uh, as sure as refusing to obey God limits his lavish blessings in our lives, it's similar to the results of prayerlessness, right? If we ask not, we have not. God, God can't answer a prayer that hasn't been requested, a request that hasn't been made. He can still do whatever he wants, but uh, in order for a prayer to be answered, it has to be lifted. If we disobey God, we detach ourselves from the blessings he has to give. We've talked before, it was Charles Swindoll who talked to Swindoll. Can you imagine when we get to the other, other side, if there's this huge cavernous warehouse just sitting there in on the new earth uh, that carries over? He's saying this to make a point, don't go looking for it, it won't be there. But if there was a warehouse that was filled with boxes, beautiful, huge boxes, beautifully wrapped, Beautiful bows, ready to be ready to be delivered to the recipient, and and the, the warehouse was filled with these boxes, these gifts that are labeled prayers never requested, that could have been dispensed and would have been dispensed had they been requested, and so prayerlessness limits God's action in our lives, and and certainly disobedience short circuits it uh, because of its serious significance. Last but not least, in the focus there. At least, I trust this for you. Why else would we? Why else would we be together? With you, I want God's blessings to reach others through us. Do you want that? Isn't that what you want? Don't you want God's blessings to you to reach others through you? Because if they're real blessings from God, you won't be able to contain yourself. I said before, as my old. I think we're going to sing a song that, as we close this morning from, that David Brony wrote. I love, I can just still hear him, and several times when I've been with him over the years, he, he'll say, I just got a bad case of that. I can't help it. <laughs> and the way he says it is so funny. I just, I just can't help it. And of course you can, but the, the point of that whole thing is, is he, he has blessed me. There's no way I can keep this to myself. You have no idea how good God's been to me. I have no idea how good he's been to you, but you have no idea how good he's been to me. And I can't keep it to myself. There's just not enough room for all of his blessings. And he talks about that even as these blessings will overtake us. So if you'll turn with me to the uh, Gospel of Luke and the 11th chapter in Luke, and this one verse is the verse we're going to spring from here this morning and acknowledging how... uh, not just how beautiful and not just how important, but how powerful God's blessings are. <clears throat> the first point this morning is this, that our obedience to God, one, brings his blessings to our lives. That's been said probably ten different ways by now, right? But again, let's just say it. Our, our obedience to God, your individual obedience to the one true God, brings his blessings to your life. And our, our collective obedience brings his blessing, his blessings to our lives. Under that first point it says, someone who obeys God is someone, know, someone who knows what it is to be blessed by him because he's promised to bless obedience. And it may not include what you think it should, and may, it may not come the way you think it should, or the time you think it should. But if you, if you obey God, be on the lookout for the blessings. <laughs> if you're walking in obedience, because he said he's going to do that. And um, we'll, we're, there in Luke, we'll just look at that verse uh, and, and hear it uh, in, in and of itself. Um, again, it's important to remember any text out of context becomes a proof text, proof text for a pretext. Uh, this, this, don't, don't ever just take a verse out of context. That's dangerous. And we'll see that the context of this is a, 
is a is is some confusion and agitation that rose up because Jesus cast a demon out of somebody. And this 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 statement is the result of 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 what ensues after that. But listen to verse 18 or 28. He replied, "Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it." And the verse right before that is this verse. As Jesus was saying these things, a woman in the crowd called out, and the crowd gathered because there was such chaos because of the the casting out of the demon and and how some people just weren't too keen about that. But in verse 27, as Jesus was saying these things, he's giving teaching on what happens when an impure spirit leaves somebody and how you need to fill it with something that's right so more demons don't come back. And it's in the context of that that somebody says, uh, uh, a woman, it was a woman in the crowd called out, blessed is the mother who gave you birth and nursed you. And that's who, who, who's he talking about? The blessed, what many, many Catholic Christians would say is the blessed Virgin Mary. And this is, this is concerning. I would think this is concerning to somebody who holds fast to the, to the veneration of Mary in an inappropriate way. That's a whole nother discussion for a whole nother day. But Mary was chosen by God to be the mother of Jesus. And so this woman cries out, blessed is the mother who gave you birth and nursed you. As if, you know, sh- sh- that's, that's the pinnacle of blessing. But what does Jesus say? Because then this, because you think about the implications of this. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I already have, so I'll keep going. That, that the reality is that what Jesus says next says you and I are more blessed than, than Mary who gave birth to him when we obey him. And she's our example for believe and obey. She was, she, she, she could not, she could not comprehend what the angel was saying to her. But when the dust settled, she said, let it be to me according to your word. She believed, she submitted, she obeyed, and she lived for nine months of not just physical agony, I guess, that accompanies pregnancy. A guy will never know this, but she lived with the, all the sneering and, oh, you're a virgin, you're a virgin. All that accompanied the scandal of her pregnancy. She obeyed him and she believed him. And then this is what Jesus said, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. And you know what, you know who he's speaking to? Everyone who'll hear and obey will, will be, will be blessed in a sense beyond the measure of, of, of the Virgin Mary, the, the, the mother of Jesus, because that's who she's talking about. The, the womb that, that, uh, uh, the mother who gave you birth, some translations speak specifically of the womb and the, the breast that nursed you. And uh, no, there's a greater blessing. That's, that's the point. He brings blessings to our lives. So uh, let me just unpack that a little bit more. The verse in Luke with which we just began this message or this part of it uh, is found in the context of blowback that Jesus got for casting a demon out of someone. And in my notes it says, let that sink in. Jesus got blowback. Instead of praises and celebration, he got blowback for casting a demon out of somebody. People were upset about that. And do you know that people are still upset at God and about God when he has his way in people's lives? That's still going on. It will never not be until this life is over. And we, and we just need to acknowledge that. Someone in the crowd who realized the significance of that miracle says what that interesting thing that we just heard in, in, in verse 27. And it's Jesus' response that causes quite a stir, a stir because the very next verse says, I don't know how it's rendered in your English translation uh, or whatever translation you're using. After he says, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it, very subtly, Luke, the physician who's documenting the ministry of Jesus, writes, as the crowds increased. Well, of course they increased. This kind of stuff is it get, gets people's attention. A, a demon is cast out of somebody. The, this woman makes this statement. There's this declaration and, and confirmation and clarification by Jesus about, about what it means to be blessed. And of course that's going to draw people. People, you know, you don't need to advertise in, in that sense when things are happening this way. It caused quite a stir, a stir. And what Jesus says, again, I'll just acknowledge this one more time. What Jesus says in verse 28 is humongous. Blessed rather, 
He's not dismissing the significance of Mary by any means. He's, she's his mother. And she really did give birth to the Son of God. That is a big deal. And that is an understatement even saying it that way. But for Jesus to say these words in that context, as an observant Jew to all these Jews, and this woman who, who, who says what probably everybody there would agree with, yeah, the Virgin Mary was super blessed. And Jesus immediately takes the focus off of his mother and, sa and then puts the focus on all the people and says, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. Not just hear it. People are going to be going to a godless eternity who've heard the word. But obeying it, believing it, 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 it believing him and obeying him brings us to him and as he invites us into his family. And he goes on to, it's interesting, the very next thing he does is he validates the book of Jonah because he talks about the sign of Jonah when he's the same way that you know Jonah was in the, the belly of a, this great fish for three days. Jesus will be in the tomb for three days. He, he, he acknowledges the veracity and authority of the old what we call the Old Testament when he references the minor prophet Jonah and says, that's going to be like me, you'll see. But, but his, his response, it's his response that caused such a stir. A stir. And if you'll turn back with me the, to uh, the two Gospels before that, the first Gospel, Matthew chapter 28, uh, this is, we looked at, we acknowledged this yesterday and why it seems pertinent because Jesus, the last thing Jesus says uh, before he ascends into heaven, Mark, uh, Matthew's gospel doesn't include the ascension, but it, it, it follows what Jesus said here because his feet were still on the planet when he, when, he, when he uttered and issued or gave what we call the Great Commission. And isn't it interesting? that the very last thing Jesus says is tethered to obedience. And we talked about this yesterday. The Great Commission does not start in verse 19. It starts at the end of verse 18. The Great Commission isn't go therefore and make disciples. The Great Commission is all authority is given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore. And what's the therefore therefore? What's the therefore connected to? Before what follows the therefore, what's right before it, those very words. The Great Commission begins with the authority of Jesus in heaven and on earth. In that authority, submitted to that authority, empowered by that authority, the implication is go therefore and make disciples of every nation. And, and as he un unpacks what he has to say, he speaks about baptizing them in the uniquely defining and and uh, and uh, uh, elevating name of the triune God, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then he says, teaching them to, some translations use the word obey, some translations use the word observe. Anybody else have a different word for that? What's that? Command? Yeah, commands them, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yes, do do whatever he basically do what God says uh, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Yes, and again that goes back to the fact that it's not a suggestion that you do these things; it's a commandment that I give to you. And again, the reason he gives the commandment is because he intends to live and move through us, and it's our our obedience that positions us rightly with him. And the blessings that come from that. But it's just important to acknowledge that the very last thing Jesus said before he sends, ascends to heaven is that we, we are called to be disciples who make disciple, disciples who make disciples who make disciples who do what God says. And that is, that is also linked to the promise, I'm with you to the very end. I don't know that is conditional so much as it is experiential. That the more we obey him, the more aware of his presence we are. God, God lives and moves in us and through us as we obey him. And so end this first point with a passage in Deuteronomy, if you'll flip back there, and I'll just make this observation and read the very beginning of it. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. It's the fifth book in the Old Testament. It's the 28th chapter that we're looking at. And the entirety of the Deuteronomy 28, Deuteronomy chapter 28 is 68 verses long. This is an important 
thing just to acknowledge. I don't want to make a mountain out of a molehill. I don't want to make a molehill out of a mountain ever. But it is significant to acknowledge the ratio here. So this chapter is 68 verses long. God uses the first 14 verses to describe his blessings for obedience. 14 verses. He just he just throws it down. These are the blessings that will overtake you. These are these will be the evidence of my blessing in your life. But starting in verse 15, again, the same God who promises to bless obedience promises to curse disobedience. However, if you do not obey the Lord your God and do not carefully follow all his commands and decrees I am giving you today, all these curses will come on you and overtake you. That should cause your hair to stand on its, you know, your, whatever, goosebumps or whatever. Uh, like, these, the, he just promised to bless obedience, and we're thinking, yay. And now he's promising to bless disobedience, and we should be thinking, yikes. Because the next verses, 16 through 68, it's over two-thirds of the chapter, is given to his promise to curse disobedience. So you can't tell me and I can't tell you obedience is really important. Of course it is. And he promises, listen to the beginning of verse of Deuteronomy 28. If you fully obey the Lord. And I want to say this, fellow struggler to fellow struggler. We can fully obey him with a full heart and gladness of heart and a desire to do whatever he says, whenever he says it, however he says it's to be done. But don't you know you and I will never do that perfectly, will we? We will never do that perfectly. But we can do that fully. It can be our default. It can be the way we roll by His grace. Will we stumble? Yes. But will we stay down? No. And if we stumble in disobedience, will we continue to disobey Him and have any kind of peace in our heart? No. So let me start it again. If you fully obey, not perfectly, but if you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all his commands I give you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations. And we'll just end in the second verse. I encourage you to read the whole chapter sometime today or soon after this is over. All these blessings will come on you and accompany you if you obey the Lord your God. And isn't it interesting? He talks about you'll be blessed in the city, blessed in the country. Anywhere you go, you'll be blessed. Anything you do, you'll be blessed. If you are obeying him and you are faithfully and sincerely uh, and carefully is the word that's used in this translation, following all his commands that, that he gives, then you will be blessed. And isn't it interesting that the word is different in uh, verse 2 of Deuteronomy 28 than, than what we find in verse uh, 15 of Deuteronomy 28. Verse 2 says, All these blessings will come on you and accompany you. And this is a distinction that's very clear. People often say the devil is in the details, and I understand what people are, are alluding to at that, but there are details in the Bible that aren't from the devil, they're from God. And these details in the Bible we need to make note of. And this is a detail in the scripture. Verse 2 says, these blessings will come on you and accompany you. Verse 15 says, these curses will come on you and overtake you. Those are two different words. And again, I don't want to uh, uh, stir up something that shouldn't be stirred, but I don't want to just let it sit there if it needs to be acknowledged. Those are two different words. The blessings will accompany you. The curses will overtake you. Your life will be ruined if you disobey God, ruined. And, and, and that's not the kind of life that God brings his blessings through to people. So, again, I'm not wanting to belabor this, just to acknowledge this. Um, Matthew 28, 20 and Deuteronomy chapter 28 affirm the importance. I'll say this and we'll move to this final point. They affirm the importance and the impact of obedience. If God is obeying you, his, his bless, if not, not, no, I wish that could be rewind and we could delete that. Not if God is obeying you. That is not what I meant to say. If you are obeying God, then his blessings are yours. And those blessings that are yours because you're obeying God are meant 
to find their way to those around you. That's clearly what this is telling us. And here's the second point this morning. Our obedience to God, in turn, and I just said this, and we're going to park here for a moment before we conclude. Our obedience to God, in turn, is His blessings through our lives to others. Brings His blessings through our lives to others. So the underneath the second point, it says, keep obeying God. That's kind of a given based on what we've said. Uh, keep obeying God and keep sharing the blessings obedience brings. Turn back to Isaiah and we're going to look at this 58th chapter. It's, it's, there are a couple books out that I can't remember the author of the one I'm thinking of. But uh, And messages. If you type in God's chosen fast in the search bar on your whatever search engine you use, um, you you will find this passage, but you will also find the book I'm I'm mentioning I'm thinking of that I can't say the the title is God's Chosen Fast I forget, Charles Sheldon I think is his name Charles Sheldon I think God's Chosen Fast uh, I don't know how it's listed in your translation the heading for this in the NIV it says True Fasting some translations might say God's Chosen Fast right above Isaiah 58 verse one and this is the fast that God obviously, has chosen. A fast, not so much that uh, focuses on the fasting itself, but as the results of the fasting. And again, the second point is, our obedience to God in turn brings His blessings through our lives to others. And so we'll conclude with this staggering, uh, extremely staggering chapter in Isaiah about that ultimately is about obedience. We see that in the final two verses, verses 13 and 14 in Isaiah chapter 58. Is it verses thir- yeah, 13 and 14? Um, the importance of this chapter uh, in the Hebrew Bible, what we call the Old Testament, cannot be overstated. Some, there's a lot of things in the Bible that can't be overstated, can they? They do need to be stated at least. Uh, here, in that it clearly and concisely communicates God's heart for our place in this world. God has you and I in this world to what? You can Yes, to be a blessing. There's so many ways you can fill in the blank at the end of that sentence. But in the context of this, uh, what I hope would be something you might think or say if somebody said, God has you in this world too. Uh, I, the thing I'm thinking that I hope will be clear when this is done is make a difference. Make a difference. And the implication of that is, for God, for good, to make a difference. And the, and the whole point that we'll end with here is you can't really make a difference unless you're different. And this whole chapter is about how different God's people should be than people who aren't God's people. All of us are God's children in a sense. We're made by God, children in our shared humanity. But only those who, who have faith in Christ are sons and daughters of God. And so, this is so very important that this chapter describes the, the result God desires for, for true fasting, for the fast that He chooses. Um, and in fact, that, that phrase is found there in the sixth verse, is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen? This is what I want the results to be. Anybody can fast. Jesus talks about the hypocrites that, you know, put, uh, you know, on their face and make themselves try to look all like emaciated and all like, oh, I'm fasting, I'm fasting. That's like blowing a trumpet before you're offering. Put the trumpet away. Don't try to, don't be a hypocrite, right? You can, you, it's not about appearances. It's about actual experiences and results that are from God, of God, and for God. This kind of fasting. Don't don't tell people you're fasting if you're fasting. That's part of the whole thing. Anybody can say they are, and then it's kind of like you just blew the whole deal. This is between you and God. You and God. And he clearly says at the beginning of this, he, he, he throws it down here. Shout it aloud. Do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their rebellion. Ooh, it sounded good up to that, didn't it? Declare to my people their rebellion and to the descendants of Jacob's their sin. You want me to raise my voice? You want me to shout that? You want me to blare that like a trumpet blast? Mm-hmm. This is the prophet Isaiah. 
And then he goes on to say what the deal is. Day after day they seek me out. They seem eager to know my ways as if they were a nation that does what is right. It is not forsaken the commands of its gods, the commandments. They ask me for just decisions and seem eager, second time he said that, for God to come near them. And then they, they, they complain, why have we fasted? And you have not seen it. Why have we humbled ourselves and you have not noticed? It's like those questions betray your heart. Those questions you're asking are the problem. I do see it. I do know. And just because you didn't get the results you thought you were going to get trying to manipulate me? You're upset about this? And he just, he, he lets him have it. Yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please and explode all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists. Yeah, let's all fast. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's literally what it gets to. Just the anger and the animosity and the conflict. That's the result of seeking God? No, it's not. That's why he's so upset. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of fast I have chosen? Only a day for people to humble themselves? Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying in sackcloth and ashes? And the whole point of those, those, those are, what, what's the, what are they called? Uh, rhetorical questions. They're, they're rhetorical questions. The answer is inherent in the asking because it's God asking. We have a problem here, basically, is what he's saying. Is You think this is the kind of fast I've chosen that ends up with you throwing punches at each other? No way, Jose. And then verse 6 is the passage we'll look at. 6 through 14, the, very, the rest of the chapter. Is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen? To loose the chains of injustice, to untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke, every injustice, every iniquity. Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? And when you see the naked, to clothe them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood? Then your light will break forth like the dawn, and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help, and he will say, Here am I. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing finger and malicious talk, and if you spend yourselves in behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like noonday. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Where is this happening? In a sun-scorched land. And then he says, your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up the age-old foundations. You will be called repairer of broken walls, restorer of streets with dwellings. If you keep your feet from breaking the Sabbath, and here's the problem, they were, they were living in disobedience. This is the issue. These last two verses shine the light on the problem. You, you're, not, you're not honoring the Sabbath. You're not keeping the Sabbath. From doing as you please on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight and the Lord's holy day honorable, and if you honor it by not going your own way and not doing as you please or speaking idle words, then you will find your joy in the Lord. And our joy in the Lord clearly is connected to our, our obedience to the Lord. And I will cause you to ride in triumph on the heights of the land and to feast on the inheritance of your father Jacob, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. This is the prophet Isaiah prophesying. This is the prophet Isaiah saying what God told him to say. And it clearly didn't make his life easier. And that's the issue. That these blessings that overtake us are meant to show up by the way we behave toward and care for others. You okay having your third meal of the day when you know your neighbor hasn't even been able to eat any kind of breakfast? I 
And I'm not, I'm not saying we're here to save anybody, but this, that's, that's the heart of what this addresses. Where there's any iniquity, where there's any injustice, when God gives us more than we need, it's not just so that we can have some cushion. I'm not saying there isn't wisdom in preparing. That, that's, they aren't in opposition to each other. But it is to say, if you know somebody's in need and you have the means by which that need can be met, not again, not just financially, but sometimes financially, you don't want to enable somebody who's not being wise with their finances, but if somebody legitimately is in a, is in a dry period and they are, haven't been wasteful, but they don't have, and you do have, it's time to do something about that. That's all of what this is saying. To, 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 to break every yoke. And it's been said many times, if we as God's people were doing what God's people were supposed to be doing, not only would this world be a better place, I'm going to get in trouble for saying this, but that's okay. I'm going to say it anyway. We are allowing, at least in this country, the government to do what we should be doing. And they're not asking for our money. They're taking it and spending it as they see fit. But if we as Christians would do right with what we have, we wouldn't need all these, there wouldn't be these government programs. The church would take care of that. People would take care of that. Christians being neighborly would take care of that. Oh, I just muddied the waters and I don't have time to unmuddy it. Sorry. But, but that's a very real issue. Why are we allowing the government to do what we should be doing for those around us? We should be okay with that, I guess is what I'm saying is God's people. Now, I'm really in trouble, and I think I'll end the message. <laughs> but seriously, if we were doing what we were supposed to be doing, it would be a whole different, whole different way, a whole different world. There's, there's very, very little doubt about that. Maybe you've seen the, the meme where, or the, where so, in so many words the, 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 the thought is, is given. I think I wrote it down. Um, maybe I didn't and just thought I did. But let me just read these last couple things. When things aren't the way they're supposed to be, it becomes an invitation to us to do something different. So something that should be happening that isn't happening begins to happen. God is telling us that obedience changes us and then he uses us to bring change to others. And again, the issue of obedience is seen in those last two verses of Isaiah 58. And it's certainly an expression, an Old Testament expression, an Old Testament expression of what being salt and light is supposed to look at, like. Like we're God's people, we should be different. So that's what a child of God looks like, people should be thinking and saying about us. So that's what one of God's sons and daughters looks like. And um, somebody posted this meme a long time ago, but the gist of it was, listen, if 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 you have more than you need, don't build a bigger, thicker, higher fence. And I'm not talking anything about borders and, and, and uh, immigrants in this by saying this. Many people's minds will go there. I'm just talking about you and me personally right where we live. If we have a lot, more than enough, that's not so that we can build a bigger fence and, and have a nicer garage that we can get right into and right out of so we don't have to see our neighbor. Uh, no, that's not what this is about. If you have that, don't build a don't build a higher fence. Build a longer table, and invite people to have some food. That's just very real, isn't it? Because it's not about you and it's not about me. It's about us. God loved the world. He wants us to reach the world. He wants us to make a difference. And I'll say it one last time and and end. The only way you and I are going to make a difference is if God makes us different. And gives us the heart to be kind and generous and give sacrificially and love and serve sacrificially, just like Jesus did. In the upper room, when he got up and put on a servant's, wore servant's clothes, clothes and started washing their feet because they were jockeying for position, who's going to be the greatest? Oh, you guys. He didn't, and we've looked at that passage. He doesn't say a word, he just gets up and starts washing their feet. And it's silence till Peter opens his mouth. Silence. Because he came to serve. And that's what we should be doing. Two different people whose lives impacted the world different ways and who died different deaths. Many of you know who Howard Hughes is, right? One of the guys in the world, like the Rockefellers and 
and uh, others who've had way more money than a person ever needs. It's so beautiful when you see philanthropy flowing freely. But you know how Howard Hughes died? If you've never seen the movie Aviator, there's some stuff in it I wish wasn't in it, but it's, it's a true story of, of Howard Hughes. Uh, Leonardo DiCaprio plays Howard Hughes in this movie called The Aviator. Do you know how Howard Hughes died? Full of syphilis, emaciated, and his nails were all curly because he hadn't cut them for years. Howard Hughes died a tragic death with more money than a man would ever need. And then there's this guy named Richard Stearns. Anybody recognize that name? He's still alive. In 1950, Richard Stearns was an incredibly successful businessman. And you know what he did with all his money? Started World Vision. He started World Vision, a human compassion agency that has literally saved millions of lives and brought the gospel to millions of people. They both had a ton of money. One kept it all to himself, and he died. Read, read his biography. Look at look, Wikipedia will be enough. Just look at how he died and the condition in which he was in when he died. Howard Hughes. And then look at the result of Richard Stern's life. He was blessed to be a blessing. And there will be people in heaven who will find their way to him and say, that was you, wasn't it? <laughs> which is just, just such a beautiful thought. Whenever you and I do the right thing in obedience to God, it, the consequences won't just be something we know and see, but they will go far beyond our grave, and they will continue to have a, a, a domino effect of impact on the lives of others if we'll obey God. And so again, obedience to God brings blessings to and through you. Don't you want to be a conduit of God's blessings? I know you do. It's very simple. Obey him. Just obey him. Watch. You'll see. It's a beautiful thing. Here are the making real questions. How does knowing obedience brings God's blessings inspire you to obey? Only you can answer that. I hope it inspires you to obey. Not because of what you get out of it, but because of what you can give as a result of it. And the second question is, how committed have you been to keep doing this? To, inter to turn God's blessings into blessings for others through your life. If you ever get more than you need, the first question to ask is, is there somebody who needs some of this? Whatever it is. And of course, the more than you need that somebody who needs some of this is your relationship with God. That's the biggest blessing in your life. If you're his son or you're his daughter, that's the biggest blessing to share. He would love to have you and his family too, if you're not his yet. And the action step, very simple. Look for ways this coming week and for the rest of today, in fact, if, if uh, whatever you're doing today and wherever you're going to be around people, look for ways this coming week to be obedient to God and kind and generous to others with the blessings he's given you. There's so much more that could be said, but it's time to stop. And uh, I trust that God will help us as we go here today to uh, not be okay with what he's not okay with, especially just hoarding his blessings, but to just trust him for whatever's left of our lives. For each one of us, whatever the time is between now and we go to be with him or he comes to get us, may his blessings in our lives that come through our obedience to him be seen as an opportunity to be a blessing to others. As I look around, some of you, some of you just model that to me. I know that's how you roll, and I appreciate your example to me. And let's be an example to each other and to those around us, who, especially who don't know him yet. Um, don't know how much time is left, but we got today, don't we? Let's do this. <laughs> let's pray. Father in heaven, we look to you with confidence in who you are. We confess that you are, you are holy. And we cry out to you again as Jesus taught us to pray. We ask that your kingdom would come and your will would be done here on earth as it is in heaven, which making it very personal means in and through each one of us. God, we pray for today's message to penetrate our hearts and to change our lives. Help us trust you to cause whatever seeds you've planted in these last several minutes to sprout and grow and make a difference that changes us, brings change to others. May our lives tell your story of blessing after blessing after blessing and kindness after kindness after kindness 
and expressions of love after love after love. May we share these blessings with everyone. And God, we would pause and acknowledge and lift to you those for whom tomorrow is a very difficult and even dreaded day of heartbreaking remembrance. What happened on September 11th, 2001 changed the world. And we pray that you would be near and comfort those for whom this day brings a, 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 just another experience of grief. We hate what happened that day. We thank you that out of it has come so much good, but we hate that so many people lost their lives that day. Comfort those who continue to grieve. May, may even the remembrance of September 11th serve to remind us that all the world's fallenness, starting with our own fallenness, isn't what lasts forever. Only you and your kingdom and your people will be forever. Thank you that we're going to a place where there's no more death or darkness or demons or deceit or disease. None of it. For now we pray for the grace to navigate it. And then finally, God, we pray for whatever the future holds for us as your people. Only you know what's ahead for each one of us and everyone on this planet. May we live the life you've given us the way you intend. One day at a time, with an unwavering commitment to the great commandments and the great commission. Keep us focused on loving you and loving our neighbor and making disciples. And of course, connected to that is what we just talked about today, about being obedient to you. Deliver us, God, from any lesser thing. And we praise you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Thank you, God, for being who you say you are. And together we say it with all our hearts again. We trust you. We love you. We believe you. And we thank you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. The benediction today is this. Keep obeying God and giving his blessings away. Keep doing justly and loving mercy and walking humbly with him. Amen.